Okay, so this audio lecture is going to focus on recruitment requirements and growth, and so this covers information that's in chapter 7 and 8. And so we want to keep in mind with microbes, these are cells, and so we want to think of what nutrients do microbes require and really what nutrients do cells require. And just like our cells have nu nutritional needs, microbes have nutritional needs. And because we are cells, <laughs> they are cells, a lot of the nutritional requirements are going to be the same. So if we look at this table from the textbook that looks at the chemical analysis of a microbial cytoplasm, looking at E. coli, um, we, can, we can see the organic compounds, um, so these macromolecules in which a cell would have, and again, um, for the most part, these percentages are a little varied between different cell types, um, but on average for an organism, they're going to be around the same, and so if we look at the total weight, proteins are going to be the bulk of what makes up a cell, okay? And these proteins are anywhere, anywhere from transport proteins to proteins um, that act as enzymes to catalyze reactions, and so if you remember... Um, Proteins are amino acids that are chained together through a peptide bond. Um, and then we have nucleic acids, um, which can either be RNA or DNA. Um, and so that's our next area. So if we think about a cell, um, there's going to be a lot of genetic material that hold, holds the instruction manuals. Just like if we look at a library, there's a lot of components to a library, but the books um, take up space too. Um, and then we have our carbo carbohydrates or sugars um, that are going to be re um, important in um, providing energy to the cell. And then we have lipids that are going to be present in all the membranes. And so keep in mind, I guess one of the you know um, variations here would be that a prokaryotic cell like E. coli, a bacteria, won't have as many intracellular membranes because they don't have the organelles present. So if we looked at a eukaryotic cell, we would probably see this lipid level a little bit higher than we would with a bacteria cell. Now there's also inorganic compounds like water, um, and so that's why if you look at the total, the percentage total weight, um, we're going to have 70% of that being water. Now when you look at dry weight, we're removing all that water, so that's why there's nothing there. Okay. Now, we broke this down into individual elements. Um, we would see that our top four would be carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And then we have phosphorus and sulfur right behind that. Um, and so if you think about any of these macromolecules, whether we're looking at proteins, nucleic acids, or carbohydrates, it's not surprising that carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen are the top four, right? So if you think about carbohydrate like glucose, um, we have carbons, we have oxygen, and we have hydrogen present. And so um, they're the majority of molecules of compounds would be made up of carbon. I mean, we're carbon-based organisms. Our cells are carbon-based, and so carbon's going to be the majority of that. Now, if we were looking at per molecule um, or per, per um, element, um, hydrogen would be higher up there, but keep in mind that its mass, its weight is much lower, um, so it's going to be, you know, outweighed by carbon. So you, you would have to have um, 12 hydrogens to equal one carbon in weight, and so that's why there's a little bit of shift there. But definitely, um, you know, if we look at proteins and nucleic acids and carbohydrates and lipids, um, it's going to be that carbon backbone. And then we're going to be having oxygen and hydrogen and then nitrogens um, coming off of that. And again, phosphorus is also abundant in sulfur. Um, as a protein biologist, I think sulfur is really important because um, proteins get stabilized through these disulfur bonds. Um, so... And then after that, we have these other elements that are definitely play a critical role, but they're found at um, a at a smaller percentage. So potassium, sodium, obviously those are really important um, for ion flexing. Um, and we'll look. Um, there's a big, uh, slide later on that looks at each of these individual individual elements. Um, calcium, magnesium, um, those are really important for motor proteins and movement.
um, within this inside the cell, so in a cellular level. And then chlorine, iron, and then these trace um, metals, all are important um, elements. But again, when it comes to um, trying to retain information in the course, it would be those top four that I would expect everybody to know. And that goes back to, um, if you look in chapter two and look at those macromolecules and basic structures of those, you would find they're made up of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. So as far as a carbon source, um, you can, um, organisms can get carbon in two different forms. Um, they can be heterotrophic or autotrophic. So autotrophic, auto self, so they would actually be able to metabolize um, carbon sources on their own. And so photosynthetic organisms are able to do that. Heterotrophs, they re rely on other organisms to give them a carbon source. So they're going to have to eat or consume other organisms or products of other organisms in order to get carbons for them to rearrange and make these macromolecules. With nitrogen, the main source of nitrogen on Earth is N2 in the air. Um, and so um, this is actually not usable for most organisms. So if we think about um, in A and P, if you talked about the respiratory system and you looked at the percent of nitrogen when you breathe in and then when you exhale, that percentage st stays virtually the same. So you don't absorb nitrogen through breathing, um, just like um, like a bacteria you know, they're not going to breathe in nitrogen. Um, it's going to have to be absorbed through. Um, and so the primary source in of nitrogen for heterotrophs would be through the consumption of proteins or nucleic acids. Um, and that's because they need to build proteins and nucleic acids, okay? There are some bacteria and algae that actually are able to utilize non-organic nitrogen um, nutrients. Um, and they're able to transform <clears throat> O2, which is either found in the air um, or in the soil, and they can convert it to usable nitrogen um, through a process called, called nitrogen fixation. So you re might remember in the first unit, we talk, mentioned about cyan bacteria, these bacteria that used to be called blue-green algae. Um, they're really interesting because they can undergo photosynthesis but they can also undergo nitrogen fixation. So again, they can take unusable nitrogen, N2, and convert it to usable nitrogen. And so in agricultural settings, um, this ability for these bacteria to undergo nitrogen fixation can be utilized as a source of a biofertilizer. So instead of having to spray crops with um, a nitrogen fertilizer, you can actually inoculate the soil um, with cyan bacteria and they will actually convert that um, soil, th that nitrogen that's in the soil to usable nitrogen for another crop. So a lot of times what happens is um, there are a type of plant called legumes, like soybeans, peas, um, and other beans. Um, they're in this class of family known as legumes, and legumes actually produce these little nodules on their root systems, and in that nodule, the cyan bacteria will live. So again, they convert the nitrogen for the peas or the soybeans, but then they also deposit that nitrogen into the soil so it's usable for the next crop. So what farmers will do is they'll actually rotate the crop, so every like five to seven years, they'll in a field, they'll plant soybeans um, and then the other years they'll plant their crash, ca cash crop, whether and usually that's like corn. Now, it used to be that the soybeans were just kind of a, you know, an off year. You didn't make money off of it. But if you look at a lot of your products, you actually have soy products in there. Um, and so, you know, farmers got smart um, and they found a way in order to make money off of that kind of off year. Um, and again, they'll rotate it so that if you went to an agricultural area where there's lots of farms, you would notice um, there would be a field or two that would have soybeans planted in it, but the other fields would probably have like um, cotton or um, corn planted in it. Definitely up north, it's usually corn. Now when we look at hydrogen, um, 
it's going to be a major element in all of our organic and also some of the inorganic compounds. Um, so we would need to have hydrogen present um, in order for those macromolecules, again, like proteins, um, like nucleic acids. Um, and But we also need it in order to have an energy source. Um, <clears throat> so in, the, in order to produce ATP, um, whether you're eukaryotic and pumping hydrogens across the mitochondria, or whether you're prokaryotic and pumping hydrogens across the cell membrane, those hydrogens are going to be required in order to then come back in so that we can um, form ATP. So that's what we mean as serving as a source for free energy. Um, that process of cellular respiration occurs in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And again, it's through this pumping of hydrogen uh, molecules. We also have hydrogen playing a role in forming hydrogen bonds between molecules. Um, so that's how um, molecules will actually stabilize themselves. Um, kind of sim similar in some sense as those disulfur bonds. Um, but those hydrogen bonds usually have a smaller energy to them because they can be non-covalent, um, but the additive effect and can, can be equal to some of these um, quote-unquote stronger bonds. Okay. Also, um, maintaining pH, um, that's done, pH is the concentration of hydrogen, um, and so being for a cell to be able to maintain its pH um, is done through hydrogen. Uh, when we look at the immune response to microbes later on in the semester, we'll talk about how um, immune cells change their pH in order to digest um, bacteria. But bacteria can also produce and change the pH around them because some bacteria like an acidic environment or some like a basic environment, some like a neutral environment. And so the ability to... Um, regulate and change your um, your pH around you allows you to survive as a as a prokaryotic as a bacteria cell just like it does as a eukaryotic cell whether you're you know an individual eukaryotic cell like the protozoans or um, the yeast or whether we're talking about multicellular organisms And then so for phosphate, again, phosphate um, is going to be important um, for organisms to have. Um, so a lot of times that's found in their environment around, especially for um, environmental microbes, soil microbes. Um, it's going to be an important component to nucleic acid, but it's also going to be found in ATP. So ATP being that um, energy molecule. And so ATP has three phosphate groups um, and so you would need to have enough phosphate um, in order to create the ATP or um, and the precursor to ATP is ADP so diphosphate so those have two phosphate groups so you have to add a phosphate group onto it in order to then have energy stored in ATP um, and then we also have the phospholipids that are found in the cell membranes and um, phosphate can also act as a coenzyme um, and the coenzyme is going to allow for an enzyme to become activated. And so just in case, you know, these top four are not your favorite, um, you know, element, um, there are, are definitely additional elements that are really critical in microbial metabolism. Again, these are some of the same um, elements that are important in your metabolism. Um, and so we just want to keep that in mind that again at the end of the day um, we are a bunch of cells and microbes are, are a microbe is a cell too um, and so depending upon whatever your favorite one is you could look at it in here again my favorite one is sulfur and that's because of its role in amino acids um, and protein folding um, but definitely um, other molecules are just as important like sodium and allowing for transport um, and iron, which is impo important for some of the cytochrome proteins and such. Okay. So just to keep in mind that there are essential organic nutrients. Um, these are amino acids, um, nitrogen bases, or vitamins that are needed by the microbe, but the microbe can't synthesize. Just like we 
As humans cannot synthesize everything we need, we need to get some of that through our diet. Microbes are the same way. Um, certain microbes are going to lack certain enzyme systems, so certain pathways to produce a certain vitamin or an amino acid, and so they need to be able to get that through their diet, just like we do. Um, and for a microbe, their diet is whatever's around them, right? So whether that is for soil bacteria, the soil around them, or for a microbe that isn't a human, um, a microbe, you know, you become their food source. So when you eat, you're potentially providing them with sources of these individual elements, but also some of these um, organic compounds that they cannot produce themselves. Which that kind of jumps ahead on the, where do microbes get their nutrients? And so microbes can fall into different nutrient nutri categories. Um, and so for our autotrophs, autotrophs are going to be making um, their energy. Um, their energy for themselves. Um, so photoautotrophs are going to utilize sunlight. Chemoautotrophs are going to use simple inorganic compound um, chemicals, and they basically can build with that. So the, um, the chemoautotrophs are a unique group. Um, so we have uh, methogens um, that can use meth methane um, as basically these building blocks in order to um, get energy and as a carbon source. Um, and then another example would be these deep sea thermal vent um, microbes and bacteria that we see. So um, again, those are really unique character um, organisms that have unique um, enzymatic pathways. Um, they're, again, we tend to see those more in our um, environmental microbes and not in our um, medical microbes. And then with the photoautotrophs, again, these are photosynthetic organisms. So these would be like for microbiology, algae, and scion bacteria. But if we think about biology in general, we also have plants um, that would be photosynthetic. For our autotrophs, um, these are chemoautotrophs. And again, they're going to get their nutrients from other organisms. So again, our protozoans, fungi, and many bacteria, included, and then if we look larger scale ourselves, um, utilize this um, strategy in order to get energy and carbon. Um, within our microbes, we can have suppores, um, and so those ones are going to actually metabolize dead um, organisms. So these are known as decomposers. So Fungi um, and bacteria are good at doing this, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment, um, so I'm going to say stay tuned. And then for parasites, they're going to um, feed off of living organisms, um, so a living host, and so they would either feed on fluids within the host or tissues. Um, and so these parasites, you know, are pathogens, um, and they could be anything from bacteria to fungi to protozoans um, to parasitic worms, etc. Okay. Um, and then we have photoheterotrophs, um, and so photoheterotrophs are going to use light in their photosynthetic, um, but they are going to rely upon other organisms for carbon sources. So when you look at parasites, um, again, parasites are going to utilize a host um, in order to get their nutrients, and that host is living. Um, and there is a whole course, um, Bio 316, um, that you could take on parasitology, and that focuses on parasites, on um, both ectoparasites, endoparasites, intracellular parasites, and obligates of parasites. Um, so ectoparasites will live on the surface of the body. Um, so for humans, they would be living on the skin. Um, with endoparasites, they're going to live within inside the or um, the host. Um, so in organs or tissues, um, and so in our GI tract or such. Intracellular parasites are going to live with inside the cell of a tissue of an organism. Um, and so it actually is a great way to evade the immune response um, because you're tucked inside of the host cell. So 
the immune system can't see you as well. Um, and then we have obligate parasites, and this is where they're unable to grow or complete their life cycle without a living host. Um, so we definitely see that in parasitic worms, um, where they require to be inside that that um, inside a host in order to go from the adult to egg stage. Um, we also use the term intercellular oblig obligate intercellular parasite with viruses, um, and that's because they require a host cell in order to replicate, to make copies of themselves, because they lack the machinery, as you know from our first unit. Um, and then intercellular, because they go inside the cells to do that. Um, so again, how do uh, microbes get the nutrients in? Um, and so a wonderful example of this would be the some pores. Um, so again, um, these could be bacteria or fungi, um, yeast, molds. Um, and what they'll do is they'll actually secrete out enzymes. Um, so they have exoenzymes. Exoenzymes are ones that are secreted out. And so these digestive enzymes get secreted outside past their cell wall. Um, and that then breaks down that material. So you can see those blue blobs are breaking down into smaller little particles. And then those smaller particles are able to actually be transported inside the cell. So, I mean, this is a great strategy if you have a cell wall, right? So if you have a cell wall, you can't just, you know, engulf this material like you could if you were like an immune cell. Um, because our immune cells don't have cell walls, so they can just change their shape, bear hug, and internalize. And we'll talk about that process of phagocytosis later on in the semester. So again, microbes, um, again, bacteria, fungi, can't use a strategy of phagocytosis because they have a cell wall. And so again, the way they do this is, get around this, is that they end up... Um, releasing this enzyme, digestive enzymes, just like we re would release digestive enzymes into our stomach, um, and that breaks the material around them into smaller molecules, so then they can then absorb it. Okay. Um, some organisms use multiple strategies in order to get um, nutrients in. Obligate some pores would um, exist strictly on dead organic material, um, so these would be obligate decomposers. Um, the only way they're going to get nutrients is through, you know, a dead organism. And so again, if you think about this strategy, a living organism can fight back, just like we fight back with our immune system. Um, a dead organism's not going to do that, so it's a whole lot safer. So if you're a bacteria or a fungus and you can't move because you're not motile, again, good strategy, find dead material so you're not worried about it moving away from you and you being left behind with no food source. So again, if you went out into the woods, um, you would definitely see decomposers. You would be able to find um, bacteria and fungi um, that are able to um, exhibit this behavior. Now, in order to get the nutrients in, um, it has to get across the membrane. Um, and so a lot of times this requires a carrier, so a protein that's going to bring bind it and bring it across the membrane. Um, in some cases, this goes against concentration gradient, and if it does, then it requires energy. Um, you, you can't talk about biology without talking about osmosis. Um, so just keep in mind, um, a bacteria cell is no different. They have to regulate the water concentration and the concentration of molecules inside and outside their cell. So the goal of all cells are to be isotonic. Um, so this is where the movement of molecules and water are the same in and out, so that you're at this like homeostasis. Um, pressure is the same. Um, if a cell is put into a hypotonic solution, um, what's going to happen is the water is going to move into the cell. Um, so this is where if the concentration of the water is higher outside of the cell, so um, again cytoplasm normally is be like we'll say 70% water, and so if we were to take a microbial cell and put it into a 100% water solution, that would be a hypotonic solution. So the water would move inside the cell to even out the concentration um, so that you would end up with a 
um, you'd also have your molecules moving out of the cell too, um, so that you're going to end up with more of like a 90% inside and outside the cell. Now this is a higher percentage inside the cell than it was used to, so what can happen is the cell can actually lyse. Um, and that's especially true if there's no cell wall. Um, in most cases, uh, if there's a cell wall, the cell wall will actually stop this excessive amount of water coming inside the cell. So a nice little adaptation um, that an organism could have. You know, if you're in, uh, if you're an aquatic microbe, having a cell wall is very important so that you are able to better regulate water concentration. Now, if we were to take our microbial cell and put it into a hypertonic solution, this is where the concentration of water would be lower than inside the cell. So again, if our concentration of water inside the cell is 70%, if we put it into a 50% water solution, so this could be like salt water, where it's like 50% water and 50% salt, what would happen is the water would move out of the cell and so what can happen is what's known as plasma lice, um, where the bacteria, where the cell actually shrivels, the cell membrane actually shrivels up. And in this case, if you have a cell wall, the cell membrane will actually kind of dis detach um, from the cell wall, and this can be permanent, and the cell can um, die from that. So again, isotonic is always the goal of the cell. Um, hypotonic concentration is going to be high water concentration is going to be higher outside and so that water then moves inside the cell. If there are not um, adaptations, if they're not structures to prevent lysing, the cell would lyse. In the hypertonic solution, concentration is low, water concentration is lower outside the cell, so the water moves from inside the cell to out to balance that concentration out. And what can happen is this the cell will shrivel um, and can, um, if we have a cell wall, the cell membrane can actually um, detach from the cell, the cell wall. Um, so again, no textbook, can, no biology textbook cannot have osmosis, isotonic, hypertonic solutions. And so this just shows you another um, kind of example of this. This is where now we have a semi-permeable membrane. And so, again, keeping in mind that it's not just water that's moving, but um, ions and other molecules, solutes, can move also. And so we had mentioned with transport, we can have um, movement of material from outside the cell into the cell um, and the other direction too. And so a lot of times this is um, carried out by carrier proteins that can work as a channel um, and they can move molecules across in a selectively permeable fashion across the membrane. We can also have active transport and this is where energy is going to be required. And so when we look at glucose, um, transport of glucose tends to be active. So we put in a little bit of energy to get the glucose in, but that's because we don't know when the next time we'll have glucose available. Um, so it's worth expending some energy to get glucose in so you can make more energy. Um, and so um, later on in the semester, if, we're, if we talk about um, cellular respiration, we'll talk about this glucose transport. So getting molecules in and out of the cell um, has a lot of cytosis to it. Um, and so we can have endocytosis. Um, this is where particles are going to be engulfed. Um, so the process of phagocytosis would be a specialized endocytosis. There's also a process called um, tergocytosis. Um, so phagocytosis is whole cells and large particles being engulfed. Tergocytosis is where just small amounts are taken. And a lot of times membranes are taken with it. Um, and it's a way for immune cells to kind of sample what's going on. Is there um, damage or is there not damage? And then pinocytosis, which means drinking, um, is where liquids will actually enter into the cell. And so if there is certain ions um, or small molecules, it would be sampled within that liquid that's uptake taken up. Again, these are all um, endocytosis, and then we have exocytosis, and this is where um, material would be secreted out of the cell. So exo, out of, endo, within. So endo bringing in, exo bringing out. Um, and so 
what we would recognize as secretion would be exocytosis. Um, in a eukaryotic cell, this is where a vesicle could be um, packaged and filled with material and then released. Um, so we see this process um, in phagocytosis, so the entry of material, the endocytosis is part of phagocytosis, but then we also have the exiting of that material through exocytosis. In a bacteria, they're not able to make the vesicles, um, so this process is going to be more of a transport across the membrane. Um, and again, this is where carrier proteins would be utilized to do this. So microbes can live in um, dramatic um, environments, so they have to come up with ways to adapt to those environments so they can survive. There's a number of adaptations of microbes so that they can live in different osmotic conditions. So we already mentioned that we have um, the cell wall that allows for this bacteria cell um, to help maintain its shape, even when it's in a um, hypertonic, um, hypotonic solution, um, and can also in, in some ways um, if we look at gram-negative bacteria where they have an outer membrane, that's also would be an adaptation that allows them to also um, be more likely to survive in a hypertonic solution because you have that extra layer so it's harder for the water to exit the cell. Um, usually when we look at a bacteria that's going to be living in a hypotonic, a hypertonic solution, like salt water, they might have some inclusion bodies um, that will house salt crystals, so they'll actually take up some of the salt and that actually kind of tricks the system in thinking that the concentration of water inside the cell is lower, so they're less susceptible to dehydration. Um, so these bacteria that live in um, salty environments like the Dead Sea, it's not actually dead, um, would be known as halo biles. Um, so halo being salt, biles, love, so these bacteria like salt in salty environments which again would be a hypertonic solution. Microbes also live in um, different temperatures. Um, so we tend to think of mesophiles, which is that green line, because if you look at the temperature, um, if we think about humans, humans' body temperatures are 37.5 degrees Celsius. Sometimes people just say 38 degrees Celsius. Um, and so that's right at that optimal range for those mesophiles. So our medical microbiology microbes, um, those are going to usually be mesophiles. If you think about in the lab, um, the incubators are going to be set at 35 degrees Celsius. So the microbes we use in the lab um, typically are mesophiles because again that's the temperature they like. Um, if you're in the lab, you might notice that some of the incubators are set at 60 degrees Celsius. So these would be thermophiles. Um, so this is for some of the soil bacteria. Because if we think about the soil, um, the sun's beating down on it, the soil is going to be a little warmer. Um, it also tends to retain some of that heat. Um, so again, most of your soil bacteria are going to be in the more of the thermophile range um, where it makes sense to then set the incubator at their closer to their optimal temperature. Um, if you we were investigating um, environmental microbes at like um, thermal vents and lava fields, then those would probably fall into those extreme thermophiles. And so if you were, um, you know, investigating back microbes that live in um, the hot springs <laughs> out west, um, those there are microbes that do, and those would be, fall into the extreme thermophiles. Um, so their optimal temperature is, you know, above 120 degrees Celsius. Now, at the same token, um, there are microbes that love cooler events or cooler um, temperatures, and so we have our psychotrophic and psychophilic um, bacteria, and so. You can find microbes living in icebergs, um, <laughs> in snow banks. There's actually, in, in those cold temperatures, there is a bacteria that affectionately is known as watermelon bacteria. Um, and so it actually has a pink pigment it produces. And so if um, snow or ice has that present, it actually will give it a watermelon appearance. And so when I tell um, elementary school kids about this watermelon, microbe. I was like, well, does it taste like watermelon? Well, I really don't know because I haven't been to Antarctica. Um, so then the next question is, well, if I ate watermelon snow, 
would I become infected with this bacteria? And I can pretty confidently say no, because it likes a much cooler temperature. And so once you ate it, it wouldn't really be able to survive in you because your set, your thermostat is set for mesophiles. Um, and if we think about the immune response, the response we have to microbes, if we have mesophiles overgrowing and potentially damaging us an infection, our body actually will switch the thermostat, will switch our temperature. So we start to move outside of the optimal range for it. So we will develop a fever and that fever moves from the optimal growth, optimal temperature for the bacteria to a less than optimal, okay? Obviously we wanna make sure we don't damage ourselves. So extremely high um, fevers definitely should be treated um, because we can start to damage our own cells for that. But most of the enzymes in mesophiles are going to work best at our normal body temperature. They're not going to work as well. And also keep in mind that these bacteria are single-celled organisms. We are multicellular. So we are able to um, handle and deal with that change of the thermostat a little bit better. <clears throat> So we can also look at um, oxygen as a nutritional requirement. Um, and so in the test tubes to the right, you can see different growth patterns. Um, so in the lab, you know, you could grow bacteria in these in test tubes um, and you could look to the growth patterns to indicate the, ox the need of oxygen for the microbe. Um, and so looking at our first test tube, you'll notice right up at the top is where we actually see the bacteria. It's such a thin layer, it's almost difficult to see. So these bacteria need to have oxygen. Um, so they're not actually able to grow in that lower portion of the test tube. Um, it almost looks like it's not inoculated on the bottom part. But again, right up at the top is a high concentration of bacteria. Um, and so they require oxygen or they're obligate aerobes. So aerobic respiration, aerobic exercise, you need to have oxygen. Obligate, you are required to have oxygen. If we look on the other side, on the far right side to the other extreme, you notice how there's this area up at the top that does not have any bacteria present. Um, it's only found at these lower concentrations. And um, you can see at the, you know, probably bottom three quarters is cloudy indicating bacterial growth. In some cases, this is even more dramatic where half or even just a quarter of the test tube has growth in it. Um, so these would be obligate anaerobes or strict anaerobes. So this one looks a little bit more like a strict versus like a, you know, obligate because um, it does, it's growing a little higher up. As you move down that test tube, it's going to be lower concentration of oxygen. So down at the bottom of the of that test tube, you're not going to have a, you're going to have little to no oxygen available because we're not having that gas exchange occurring. Um, so again, these microbes on the far right um, test tube would be obligate or strict anaerobes. Anaerobe, just like anaerobic respiration without oxygen being present. Okay. Now in the middle, um, the middle two we can see that these growth patterns are, are a little, they're different, um, but they're not as strict or obligate. You'll notice on the second um, from the left, um, that one has more growth on the top and there's less growth on the bottom of that test tube. Um, so this would be one that we would, we would say is aerobic. Um, so definitely ha needs to have oxygen present, doesn't do well in low levels of oxygen. And then in the third test tube from the left, um, you'll notice that there's clouding microbial growth throughout the whole entire test tube. So these would be known as aerotolerant um, anaerobes. Um, so it's kind of like a take it or leave it. Um, they can deal with the oxygen being there. They don't need it to be there. Um, so they can live in all layers, um, but they are going to undergo anaerobic respiration. Um, so again, through the growth patterns of the microbes growing in the test tube, and because we actually, the way the test tube is, we'll end up with a concentration gradient of oxygen. Um, we can determine a little bit about the metabolism, um, how it utilizes oxygen in order to survive. <clears throat>
And we tend to think about oxygen because we <laughs> need oxygen. But there's also microbes um, that utilize carbon dioxide for the metabolism. Um, and so they are going to be able to utilize um, carbon dioxide as a carbon source. And in some cases, they even require carbon dioxide to be present in order to grow and to survive. Um, so what you're seeing on the, on the right-hand side in the bottom figure is actually this chamber. Um, in the chamber, you put this pouch, and the pouch actually metabolizes um, the oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. And so because this is a closed chamber, um, the bacteria in there actually have more carbon dioxide available to them than normally. So, I mean, you can kind of think of it like a bacteria, like you're just in exhaling <laughs> into this chamber. Um, but this is done through a sachet. Um, this used to be done using a candle. So you would have a um, chamber that you'd put a candle in. The candle would use up all the oxygen and release carbon dioxide um, for safety reasons. Um, the candle method has kind of gone away, um, but it's the same premise um, that this chemical reaction that's occurring um, utilizes the oxygen and then um, you have carbon dioxide um, being released into that chamber. So some of the bacteria, especially um, soil formers, um, tend to like a higher amount of carbon dioxide um, and that's just because if you think about it in the soil, they're not going to have as much oxygen present. They're going to have more carbon dioxide, and they actually um, thrive in that environment. So as I mentioned, um, there are pH is an important characteristic um, that we can use to look at um, microorganisms. Um, and so most organisms are going to like a neutral pH between 6 and 7. So those are neutrophiles. And I will say, because most microbes that are researched and looked at tend to be mesophiles, that might be a little shifted because most tissues um, in our body are going to be a neutral pH. There are microbes that do like acidic environments, so acid files. Those acid files if they're mesophiles, would be found in acidic areas in our body, like our skin, um, like our stomach. Um, so there's definitely microbes that are mesophiles that like acidic environments. Um, but definitely if we look at some of these environmental microbes, we would see more diversity among them um, because environments are going to be um, more varied than, you know, humans. <laughs> um, at least on the pH front. Um, so again, we can have acidophiles, but on the flip side, we can have alkophiles or um, ones that like basic pH, so pH above eight. Um, and so a whole host of different ranges. But again, um, research-wise, most um, organisms are neutrophiles. So within um, microbes, they also have relationships. These relationships can be symbiotic relationships where they're living closely with another organism, another bacteria, or their host. Um, and these can be partnerships that are beneficial or not. Um, so we can have a mutualistic relationship where both organisms actually benefit from the relationship. And so me as the host, I provide a place for the microbes to live. They maybe produce some vitamins or enzymes for me. Um, and so it's a win-win situation. So your gut microbes would be a good example of a mutualistic relationship. With the commensal relationship, that's where one organism would benefit and the other one's not harmed um, or benefit from that. And then parentism is the other relationship that usually is looked at. And this is where one organism benefits and the other one is harmed. And again, there's whole courses looking at parentism parasites um, and their relationships with their host. So there's also non-symbiotic relationships. Um, this is where they're not required in order for um, survival um, of one or the other um, organism. So with a synergistic relationship, um, this is where these organisms are, they might benefit, but again, they're not, it's not necessary in order for their survival. Um, with an anti anti antagonist relationship, this is where they're going to actually compete for resources. <laughs>
an example of relationships um, that have been that a lot of research has been done on is biofilms. Um, so when we look at chronic infections, it's estimated that 80% are due to biofilm formation. And this is where we have these mixed communities of microorganisms um, that are actually working together. Uh, so some of the antibiotic resistance that we see um, is due to the matrix which these, bio, these communities will produce. Um, so when they sense each other being there, they turn on um, different genes and they produce this matrix and that matrix makes it hard for antibiotics to get to penetrate into. Um, this ability to kind of take a consensus and see who's out there, how many of your friends are out there, how many of your <laughs> competition is out there, um, is known as quorum sensing. And this is done through um, small molecules. So bacteria will produce small molecules that are unique to their species. And then they'll also produce um, small molecules that are just a general language. Um, so like in the general language to a smile, it doesn't matter you know, what language you, you speak, speak, everybody knows what a smile or a frown means. And so again, bacteria can talk with this general language that all bacteria can use. And then they have specialized language, right? So some English, you know, French, Spanish, etc. Um, that only bacteria that have those receptors, and usually that is species specific, um, can sense that. And so they take in that information, how many bacteria are out there, how many are like me, and their behaviors change. So just like your behaviors would change it, depending upon who is out there, who went to a party with you. Um, so not during COVID, but you know, normally if you were to go to you know, a nightclub or a bar and you had all your friends around you, it's a little... It, it's okay to be a little riskier because your friends are going to have your back. Um, where if you don't know anyone there, you're going to behave a little bit differently because you don't have that benefit of having your friends step in and protect you. Um, so same thing with these communities. Um, those microorganisms will be more aggressive if they know there's other friends around. Um, so one of the areas of research is looking at augmenting, changing quorum sensing so bacteria can't talk to each other because a bacteria that doesn't know they have friends behaves differently. They don't tend to be pathogenic. A bacteria that has friends um, will be more likely to turn on pathogenic um, markers. And then if they get kicked out of these communities, um, because maybe you disrupted a biofilm, they actually are extremely upset that you kicked them out and you took away their friends. And so they're extremely pathogenic. So again, um, by augmenting the signals that these microbes are getting, we could potentially turn off pathogenicity and just make friendly, happy bacteria. So with this concept, um, there's lots of relationships between microbes and humans, and we'll explore more of this with chapter 13. Um, so we have our normal microbiota that's actually very protective in a symbiotic relationship. Everybody's benefiting from this. The microbes are benefiting. We're benefiting from it. But there are pathogenic relationships. Um, you know, in this course, I like to focus on both of these relationships. I think, especially for nursing students, you're going to see a lot of pathogenic relationships, but not all microbes are pathogenic. We have, from birth on, lived with microbes. Even in utero, we've lived with microbes. And so we really do have a symbiotic relationship with these microbes. And we need to make sure we're nurturing and taking care of our normal microbiota, those resident microbes that really are our fingerprint and tell a story of where we've been through our life. So just briefly, um, covering some of the information in chapter eight, we just wanna look at microbial growth. So if all the nutritional needs and symbiotic relationships are there to support the microbe, it's gonna to wanna to grow. And when we look at bacteria, they undergo a asexual mitotic um, process, binary fusion where they are going to make copies of their genetic material. They're going to create a protein band between those the two 
future daughter cells. So we end up getting, getting the septum forming and then division of those two cells. So we have two new daughter cells that have the same genetic information as long as no errors have been made. Um, and so with um, a bacterial cell, depending upon what their, um, their doubling time is, um, what a generation is for them, um, you very quickly can go from a single cell up. Um, so you can have 4.7 times 10 to the 21st cells or over 5,000 tons of material within a 24 hour period. If we look at uh, organism like E. coli, they have a doubling time of 20 minutes um, when they're actively dividing. Um, so you can see how we go, can go from one cell to two cells to three, four cells to eight cells to 16 cells to 32 cells to 62 cells, etc. cetera. Um, this, and again, thinking of this doubling being every 20 minutes, you can imagine you, know, you ate a hamburger that was contaminated with E. coli and within a couple hours, um, it's no longer that you just ate five E. coli cells. Um, you now have hundreds of E. coli cells. And again, if they are quorum sensing, they're turning on pathogenicity and they can um, definitely cause severe damage. And especially if they have pathogenicity factors like produ production of toxin. Um, and so again, um, how they double and multiply and then putting in the process of quorum sensing and putting in pathogenicity factors, um, that's where we can get um, bad microbes. But again, not all microbes are bad. So if we were to look at a growth curve of a bacteria, this is looking in the lab, but the same a uh, similar process is happening if you are the test tube, if you are the host. So when new bacteria come in, there's going to be a lag phase. During the lag phase, this is where it's being acclimated to that environment. So maybe the temperature is slightly different or a certain component is found at a different concentration. Um, and then we move into an exponential growth phase or which, what is known as a log phase, L-O-G. Um, and so this is where they are rapidly doubling um, during that time. Um, so we're going to have ex um, higher numbers of cells. Eventually what's going to happen is um, they're going to hit a stationary phase or a plateau um, where they can't grow as fast because they're utilizing up all the, the nutrients and the resources there. They're also producing byproducts of cellular respiration and um, just being alive. Um, and so some of those cells end up dying. Eventually what happens um, if nutrients is not um, added, so if we don't change the media or the bacteria doesn't move to a new location or we don't feed them more, so if we don't eat, um, what's going to happen is the bacteria will actually move into a death phase where there's more dead cells present. Um, so there's always will be some um, viable cells remaining, some living cells remaining. Um, so we'll never, you know, a, a good bacteria would always be able to like kind of hibernate, slow down the process of growth um, so that some cells would be remaining. No, growth curves are really important. Again, this is what it would look like in the lab. Um, but understanding growth curves is important because some of the medicines, the antibiotics that are used require the cell to be in that log exponential growth phase. They need to be growing and dividing. They need to be undergoing protein synthesis, DNA synthesis, in order for the antibiotic to work. If the cell is in stationary phase, um, where it's not growing, um, the drug is just not going to be as effective. Um, so this is why it's really important um, that if you're using an antibiotic, it's being used early. Um, so if you if you know you're you wait, eventually the immune system is going to kick in. Hopefully, as long as the that microbe doesn't have ways to evade the immune system. But the longer you wait, um, the less effective the antibiotic would be. So there's different ways in order to assess um, 
population growth. So one way is by using a SPAC. Um, so you might have used this in an intro bio lab. Um, in this case, um, whether the media is cloudy or not or turbulent um, indicates how much the microbe has grown. Um, so if you look in panel A, you can see how on the left-hand side you can see through that. Um, we're on the right-hand side. Um, that media is cloudy, and so that's because there's so many micro microbes. The cells have grown, grown and divide, grown and divide, and um, they're clouding the media. So when we put that into the spec, um, if it's cloudy, the light isn't going to be able to go through. And so this is where a low percentage of the light is transmitted, and this gets read as absorbance. Um, so the light is absorbed by the material. And so we can then take that information, the readout from the spec, and if we can count the number of cells, um, we can correlate that and make a growth curve with it. One of the ways that we can actually count the number of bacteria or enumerate is by doing a direct count. And this is where we would take a small sample, put it on a micro special microscope slide, um, and then look at that underneath the microscope. And then using some math equations, calculate what the original um, amount was of bacteria. Um, so you can actually get like a density re amount, so like cells per ml. Another way is by using a cell counter. Um, so this the machine actually counts. Um, so you take your um, cell solution, um, your suspension, and then you add that into this tube. And as the tube goes through this um, eye, usually there's a light that comes out, um, it will actually count the number of cells that are present. And so if I added one ml, then I would know how many cells per ml there are. Okay, um, so obviously with the slide method, the direct count, um, there's the training of someone how to actually do that process. Um, it's not that difficult, but there's, you know, math involved and everything. Um, with the, the automated counting, um, you need to have a machine. The machine more or less does it. You just pipette it in. Um, and then the machine will, will count. There's the calibrating in the machine and the cost of the machine. So most of these machines cost about, um, like at least, you know, uh, as of recent, around $30,000. Um, plus you have like reagents that you need to purchase with the machine to run it. Um, so the slide method is definitely cheaper on the, you, the slide costs about $60. Um, it's more the person running it. Um, so there's pros and cons to either way. Okay, so that concludes um, the audio lecture for the topic of nutrients, um, the nutritional needs of microbes.